tuned to the Truth Frequency. Your protection from, 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 from deception. This is Truth Frequency Radio. shores of the ghostly Hudson River. Yes, my name is Ra Castaldo, and you have stepped inside the Eye of Ra on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. And it's Saturday night, October 2nd, 2021. Can't believe it's October. I am excited to be here tonight, everybody. And of course, like I said, this is the Eye of Raw Soul Station Radio live on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. And of course, my name is Ra Castaldo, and you have stepped inside the Eye of Raw each and every week from 4 to 6 Pacific or 7 to 9 Eastern or wherever you are embedded in this matrix. Welcome, whether you're listening to us on iHeartRadio or TalkStream Live or alternative or, or paranormal radio apps or right here on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. Of course, let me remind you, you can join us right here at TFR at tfrlive.com slash chat if you want to join the chat room. And you can subscribe right here at tfrlive.com slash eye of raw to get the full archives of my show and every other show. That's here and to keep us live free every week and for free shows and to fully support the station, please subscribe. And of course, you can find me at the mystical spiral.com and the mystical spiral store.com for my custom copper jewelry, copper healing tools, and high highest grade world class crystals. That you can find also as well. Of course, you can find me at patreon.com slash the mystical spiral. Daily information on there as as well as my remote viewing network, the quantum um, quasar network that we have going on there as well. And on YouTube, exploring the Ka. And for all my Truth Frequency Radio listeners, we have a deal going on for the next couple of days. Very limited time left and on my website the mystical spiral store any item on my whole store 20 percent off and the coupon coupon code will be end summer 20 so also shout out to uh, chris and sherry geo you could find them at iolife.com and we're gonna have a great show tonight um i'm gonna be with you guys tonight for the whole show solo so we're gonna go deep into some stuff and i'm very excited shout out to the chat room of course here on tfr and i got a little allergies going right now because the cat um but i'll be all right i'll be all right usually clears up after a little while but some some cats i've been i've been really busy lately too i hope everybody is well out there i recently did an amazing show that's getting a lot of info uh a lot of people excited and, and contacting me about it with uh, Professor Chandra Wick Robinson, famous astronomer. Uh, he's a really great guy. And 
his work with the late Sir Fred Hoyle was groundbreaking ever for 40 over the last 40 years. And uh, I actually am excited about some future things that's going to be happening possibly with that as well. But you could check out that interview on my YouTube, and I uh, was on Leak Project on YouTube the other night as well, and that was a really amazing show. A lot of views are coming on that. And tonight we're going to touch something because I just did it in a Nephilim anthropology conference. And uh, excuse me for sniffling. My nose is running from being having allergies. I'm going to blow my nose in a second. Um, give me one second. There, that's better. That's better. We're better now. Uh, yeah, I, I just finished this Nephilim, Nephilim Anthropology Conference. I'm not sure if they're going to be continuing the series or not, but this was the second edition that I did. And uh, I'm going to be touching on some things we touched on tonight uh, with that as well, because uh, I went pretty deep with that. And I, I really want to get into what I even discussed with Professor Chandra, because this is part of what my, my upcoming book is about and what my information has evolved into over the years. And it's, uh, I think, some of the most important stuff that we can be working on globally as well. I mean, right now, for those that don't know, they spend a lot of time and energy looking for extraterrestrial life out there. You know, there are programs out there like SETI and different things that people are, are most familiar with as well. Uh, but... I really think radio telescopes, I mean, some people, I've re I recently heard um, some people that are also guests on, on Leak Project, and I'm not going to uh, throw people's names out there because um, I don't want to, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but some people are trying to just be rock stars and be known, you know, and, 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 and call themselves scientists when they're not really scientists and things like this. And people are talking about throwing radio waves you know, and uh, throwing radio waves into space to to with radio telescopes to be looking and, and searching for cosmic in, intelligence. When I think it, it if this w does, it's pretty bizarre, first of all, to be doing it this way. And I think a, a giant waste of money and time. And if a, a response was or has been generated from this, or if there is any attention generated from this in general, I think most likely uh, there's a high probability it would be negative attention that we 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 brought our way. And I and I want to talk about a remote viewing later on that's related to radio telescopes and the West Virginia area, right near the Point Pleasant area as well. Um, but when you think about Searching for extraterrestrial life or intelligence, Ra radio telescopes has been the way that that it's been done, you know, and and uh, a lot of time and energy is spent. When in reality, I think what we should be looking for, and I would I would say that a lot of astrobiologists, that people, astronomers out there, would agree with me without you realizing this, and. One example I have for evidence to back up my claims is, is one of the reasons why I started working with some of the astronomers that I respect and astrobiologists like Professor Chandra, who agrees with me in our interview that we should not be using radio telescopes. What we should be looking for, and, and I brought this up is, is my theory, is we should be looking for who is – who or what is sending the bacteria through space. And from where, right? Because whoever's sending the bacteria through space is uh, most likely uh, the intelligence out there that wants to be found and wants to spread their seed and continue life elsewhere. Um, you know, that necessarily wouldn't be, uh, probably wouldn't be the case for for something that uh, is uh, exchanged with intelligences through radio waves you know i think there's there's something else different going on with that but with bacteria this is an amazing way to send information throughout the cosmos all right dna can travel this way through bacteria and uh this is the knowledge of ancient occult sciences as well 
This is the ancient knowledge of even uh, the Rosicrucians and Christian Rosencruz. They talked about this. And uh, this is knowledge of, of most mystery schools. The deep knowledge of the ancient Egyptians, I do believe, was talking about bacteria being sent throughout the universe. You know, life being sent this way, DNA and information being transferred through bacteria. And when you look into ancient Egyptian symbology, they see the solar barge, right? This boat of a million. And then when you realize that the sun acts as a literal rocket launcher and you don't need rocket fuel, it acts as a solar sail that rocket launches bacteria through space it's a solar barge and it's it's sending the boat of a million years the record of bacteria right sending life through space and sending out bacteria you know uh from what i've been pulling in i've been shown that bacteria is being stored and transported by a giant intelligence that's not only in the the Kuiper Belt, but it has mega structures in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, and possibly other locations. Um, it's what NASA is now calling Arawan, and other things like what they call now Arakoth, possibly other locations in the universe as well, of course. And our sun acts as a rocket launcher. You know, it sends the bacteria flying through space. This is the solar barge, and this is what we should be looking for. There's so much that we should be looking for out there that's related to all this, right? We should be cheering. We should be cheering for that idea out there. Yeah, do it again. Another. Yeah, that is what how we should be searching for extraterrestrial life for sure. And uh, that's definitely. Um, a project I would love to work on if there's funding out there and if, if 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 I would able to be able to work with high technology. I mean, I think on the DL, this is what's really going on with China and many other places as well. And they're using some of their high tech telescopes to monitor certain areas where they think that some of this is being sent from, you know, and one of one of the areas that I, I actually think that this might be coming from. And bacteria might be sent. And if you think about it, first of all, let me let me explain it this way. Bacteria are exactly what like nano machines are, right? Bacterial phages and all of this. They are literal things like icosahedrons with these long conical structure tails with injectors at the bottom, and the top of their head that the icosahedron is is inside of it is where the information is, is stored. More information than a 500-page book has in a little tiny little microscopic machine. And inside there is where the DNA is carried. And it can inject the DNA from other species, viruses as well, that can evolve species, and transform them even, and carry them in there. And it can – bacterias like this that are carrying the, those codes of information and DNA – can be transported from solar system to solar system. And I interviewed Professor Sandra to verify some of the things that I was shown through my viewings and some of the information that came to me, like Oort clouds, right? I was shown this torosphere around our universe, around our solar system, you know, uh, put it that way, and not universe, around our 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 solar system and that throughout our universe there are other stars or suns like ours that have other planets around it and and solar systems and other or clouds and or clouds that are this is a place where comets are stored and sent out from right i was shown that there are these mega structure intelligences in the that are programming bacteria and sending them down out on objects like comets and in the ore cloud it's the first sphere of our solar system this is where the first thoughts right if you look at our universe as the brain of god literally 
like all the little planets and everything in it going on, stars, comets, meteor showers, almost like they're all the thoughts and everything that's going on in the brain of God. Like all the little synapses and neurons and dendrites are all the little meteorites and solar systems and galaxies and stuff going on in the universe, the God mind, right? And if you look at it like that, all sentient creatures are connected to this network and all thoughts are connected all frequencies are connected and cosmic harmonic law is connected to it all so certain planets that have certain harmonic frequencies and thoughts generating from it will generate certain bacterias and dna and and things that get sent to that planet according to the evolution of what's going on and the ore cloud is the first sphere in our solar system, and this is where all the comets are stored and comets are getting sent from, places like this in the Kuiper Belt. And what is the ore cloud? It's literally like this place where bacteria and objects are in suspended animation because of how cold it is there. And there's what I have been shown, and, and uh, even Professor Chandra uh, says that this is quite possibly true, that the ore cloud is stored with interstellar objects from other solar systems, objects than what's than objects from our solar systems, and they're carrying bacteria from other solar systems, frozen in suspended animation, and there's a nursery of comets throughout the whole ore cloud, right? And what's interesting is that the ore cloud is basically sending out comets and it's carrying they're carrying uh billions of years of records of viruses and evolution of species stored within that and that there's certain intelligences Right, like in the Kuiper Belt and in the Ore Cloud, that are laying this bacteria out into objects like comets and sending them out on their journeys to appropriate places. These things are not just randomly getting sent out through the universe, it's all linked. Uh, and there's more interstellar objects than objects from our own sister solar system, like I said, and they're interfacing or clouds like our or cloud is interfacing with or clouds of other star systems, exchanging objects that have other bacteria on them. And for this to happen, it literally they have to these objects have to be at just the right speed and direction to exchange these objects and the objects and the bacteria literally are getting like frozen in suspended animation. It's in guided control under cosmic intelligences. This is not by chance, right? And there's things like Oumuamua, you know, that, and another one called Borisov, these interstellar objects and these objects that have, we've recently, and, you know, uh, some of these objects like Oumuamua will just fly right by the sun. And some of them that are and, – and, and ones that do that most likely are, are – uh, we have found are, are, are not from our solar system. And the ones that are from our solar system, when they pass the sun, they sort of like gather to it like a moth to a, a street lamp. So they act differently with the sun. And, uh, you know, these are basically um, – what they would call, I think, interstellar interlopers, right? And it's quite, it's it's completely possible, you know, confirmed by Professor Chandra, Doctor Professor Chandra, that it, it, that ore clouds can exchange objects with other ore clouds, and that there are not only are these objects send, holding bacteria and sending bacteria, they have little worlds that they're cultivating on there. Even Earth-like planets and uh, things like this. And I was even shown that there are different species, cer certain different worlds that are not like the gravity on our – like different life forms that we couldn't even fathom some things on these things. And there's other things that are Earth-like on there as well. And there's also sentient beings on there that are beaming trans telepathic transmissions 
to our planet from both the Kuiper Belt and most likely the Iper, the Oort Cloud. I was shown the Kuiper Belt is what is what is sending these telepathic transmissions and also sending comets as well. There's comets within the Oort Cloud. There's comets within the, uh, the Kuiper Belt as well. And the Kuiper Belt, I do believe that what NASA calls Arawan and – they named it Arawan, and for those that don't know what Arawan is, it literally is the Welsh god of doom, right? This is not being named this by an accident. Just in the very people that are naming it, it's like they're the, the whispers of the Archons and the Anunnaki and the Nephilim bloodlines and the, the, the angelic bloodlines are within the psyche and the hybridization of our planet, and it, and it shows – Within everything that's going on and even what we name everything, you know, what what comets are named, what what movies are talked about, comics, uh, you know, uh, cartoons, music, all of this is related to the acceleration of this hybridization that's happening on our planet. And we all feel it. And yeah, it's called Arawan. You know, we're going to get deeper into that topic as well tonight as well. What I just mentioned, uh, you know, this hybridization process that's happening. It's happening through the media and f- because it's, it's transpiring not only physically through cosmic virus transformation, but the cosmic virus is, all, is through data ultimately, information. The information not only through DNA but the information that we're consuming through media as well, right? It's all linked to each other. And our sacred coordinates and our coordinates inside of our body and on our earth simultaneously are being taken over and uh, slowly, right? And there's ways we can, we can fight this, but we have to understand what we are facing first, all right? So we talk about this information with protection and, and, and the light of Archangel Michael and Jesus around us, not to glorify it, but to keep us – aware and to shield us and give us protection and ammunition of knowledge to fight this and be aware of this all and arawan was this what this object is called i was shown in 14 i first was getting visions of this and it wasn't until two years later that nasa started coming out with information and i had already been posting about it on my website from august of 2015 when i first started writing about it uh the kuiper belt and a lot of people that are saying they're having telepathic trans- transmissions from feline energies, um, and they think it's coming from beings that are associated with Lyra and different – yes, their cosmic journey may have been connected to planets from stars like – the star systems like Lyra that exist around these stars. But ultimately, a lot of these telepathic transmissions, I do believe, are being generated from the Kuiper Belt from certain megastructures like what NASA is calling Arwan. And I was shown it's something like a figure eight that's on an incline wobbling at a certain weird rotation. And it has almost like a wheel on the inside of it with a little uh, like different like realms, like different chambers inside that are little worlds that have harvests on them some of them storage facilities of bacteria some of them with actual sentient beings on them and the uh mining type of bacteria storage sentient creatures that control this are beyond what we think beings look like but when they actually come into our type of earth-like planet or planets within the habitable zone that look like ours they actually look like grasshopper type mantic type beings and some of them have been spotted on our planet and there's earth-like uh, po- possibly earth-like planets that they talk about um, related to the tea garden star if nobody's ever heard of the tea garden star, you know, it's a uh, small star and there it's it, it's in the habitable. There's like a habitable zone and there's habitable planets near Earth that we that we, then uh, more than we can possibly ever even thought of. And uh, right in our literal cosmic backyard, there's uh, a perfect zone for water to form. And uh, the planets 
orbit a sun that's basically known to us as and, and to astronomy and everything as the Tea Garden Star. I think it's Tea Garden B, I think it is, or something like this. Um, but it's not that far in the grand scheme of things, you know, and there's a few planets around the star that look a lot like earth and, and sort of some, some of our neighboring worlds. And, uh, there's basically, I know at least two planets that they found that look like inner planets of our own solar system, basically, you know, in the, in the, in the quote unquote habitable zone, you know, where there can possibly liquid, liquid water like ours. Right. And uh, this is this star, this tea garden star is a very interesting um, uh, topic. But I know we're about to come to break. You know, there's there's because there's there there's a there's a lot we can even get into with that because related to even um, the comets. And um, don't go anywhere because we are live and direct here. From the phantom ghostly shores of the Hudson River here on October 2nd, live on the Truth Frequency Radio Network, Echo Horse. My name is Rock Costaldo, and you can find me at the Mystical Spiral Store.com. We'll be right back. Quick commercials as we spiral out. Welcome back. Yes, my name is Ra Costello, and you have stepped inside the Eye of Ra on the Truth Frequency Radio Network every Saturday night from 7 to 9 Eastern, wherever you are embedded in this matrix. Thank you for joining us. Of course, you can find me at the Mystical Spiral Store.com. And End Summer 20 is the coupon code for 20% off all my products this weekend. So don't miss out on that. And I am sending out free crystals also with every order. And uh, just we are in amazing times, like I said. And it's being underreported what's happening through asteroids and earthquakes and volcanoes. There's so much going on. And it's all data. It's all information. It's all about cosmic evolution and cosmic virus, the times that we're happening right now. And – this is how life is seeded and evolution happens throughout the, the universe is through the sending and seeding of bacteria and DNA and information this way. And this is what we should be working on and talking about, you know, really interesting stuff. And Professor Chandra even agreed with me. And I do believe that there's things that exist within our Kuiper Belt and Ore Cloud, like I mentioned prior to this, um, that we should be looking for. And there's so much, so much, so much going on and such interesting times that are uh, a cusp of a very important time. And I do believe that this knowledge has been rediscovered various times throughout history. We have been infiltrated and seeded with different cultures and knowledge and sentient beings. Wow, Rebecca's now in the chat room as well. Welcome. You missed an awesome first segment. You know, 
we have been seeded with knowledge and it's been rediscovered various times and applied various ways in different times and in different ways and uh various sacred harmonic coordinates on our planet have been used for different reasons over over many different times and i do feel that it's quite friggin obvious that there have been nephilim and angelic infiltration and a hybridization that is happening through data dna on our planet right before our eyes we see it we feel it and it's happening not only physically but also within our psyche and me just being a child born in the 70s and growing up in the early 80s you notice it right in the media and me being from a a, a lineage that i'm connected to deep religious uh vibes and study and mysticism and growing up studying it for over 30 years uh when i was a kid right um similar to like when a child first sees a dinosaur and there's that sort of primal fascination that ancient memory or or you know that like genetic remembrance and and deep fascination when a child first finds out about what a dinosaur is an ancient remembrance well the same thing started happening to me when i would see certain things in certain cartoons and certain things when i was a kid in the early 80s for for instance he-man right now people laugh when they hear that but this is right from ancient canaanite and ugaritic and nephilim and rephaim terminology for those that don't know uh and then i'll break it down for you you know but first of all uh for those that don't know the canaanites had a pantheon of of gods right you had the chief gods like el and asherah the god and goddesses and you can look at these as rebellious angels that are being worshipped as gods or they are basically nephilim gods you know and their children are are, are related to all this and well and even their later bloodlines of rephaim kings and phoenician rephaim kings and uh all these nephilim kingdoms that are related all the way down to bloodlines to vlad uh the you know the impaler and and these bloodlines and also all the nephilim bloodlines in europe like the tuatha Danann and the fomorians and of of ireland and i mean all of these different bloodlines right of nephilim kingdoms now let me remind you some of these names like the fomorians and and names like this just the very uh you know that's just the very if somebody would even hear this name the very set the very the very mention of some of these names like the old irish giants called the, the very mention and sound of their name would strike trembling fear into people it would strike trembling fear into their hearts of of of, of, uh, of any living creature right and i'm talking about the whole body mind and eternal spirit would quiver they would they would be with you know they would be quivering with these chilling prickly bumps of primal fear you know uh anxiety and 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 levels of despair that would shatter your nerves like an elephant tap dancing on glass right like a like a man uh you know it would basically leave a man uh basically soaked in his own urine choking you know, on uh, the fear would be choking his lungs where he would not even be able to whimper or scream a sound, you know. And this is just like when a, a lion has a giraffe in his death clutches. You know, a giraffe actually, for those that don't know, has no vocal cords, you know. And a giraffe, some people say, is actually derived from the Arabic seraph, which is connected to seraphim, right? And a giraffe have, 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 are, are these hybrid creatures, that have all these different body body parts of different animals. They have like the legs of an antelope and the head of a, uh, you know, uh, another being and these like ears of a friggin' donkey and and 
all these different body of like a, a horse or something like all these different things going on. But then, you know, they might be weird on their body, but their head is very uh, amazing and beautiful. And they have these soft, sensual, majestic, spiritual eyes, the giraffe. And even when they're dying and in the death clutches of a lion, they keep and maintain those spiritual eyes and they do not even utter a sound while, while dying. You know, they're a very interesting hybrid creature. Some say even make baby connect Nephilim. All right, these are very interesting things that most people will never even think or talk about. And, uh, you know, when He-Man came out, it sparked that sort of ancient memory, primal memory in me. And... Uh, I, I I felt fascinated and then even like when I started to get a little bit older and I started to look deeper into some of the religious study, I realized that this is terminology straight out of the the Nephilim gods, straight out of this, right? When when you look into the Canaanite gods and some of the ancient Hebrew um, gods and goddesses, Nephilim bloodlines related to the Levant and uh, the Rephaim and all these different tribes – that come of, out of that Levant area, right? And we're talking about tribes um, that not just ones that people, mo you know, no, like most people have heard, like the Canaanites and 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 different like things. Like there's much more in the Bible that people don't realize, and you know that people don't even uh, realize that even the Canaanites, these are tribes that had giants in them, literal giants. And we have the Rephaim, we have the Amorites, the Amalekites, you know, the Gibberim, the Edomites with Esau, like me and Gary Wayne talked about last week, the Hittites, the Anakim, all these ones, right? These are all ones with, with giants in them. And uh, when you talk about He-Man, let's break this down for a minute. It's going to blow your mind because He-Man is called He-Man, Master of the Universe, right? So – the Canaanite gods and goddesses, you have El and Asherah. Now, Asherah also has other little areas around that that are connected. To Asherah is queen of the heavens. She's the queen goddess, right? Um, but there's also Astarte and Ashtaroth, which is almost like the same name. And then you have children of them that are very similar names like Anath and these names. These are all ladies of heaven. Uh, ladies of the God, and even Inanna and Ishtar are the same, pretty much the same thing. Ishtar is basically like in Akkad, the area there. You know, Inanna is like in the Sumer for the Sumerians. And then you have the Canaanites uh, with Anath, right? So all these are different areas of the Queen of Heaven, just like you have different Madonnas. They're prototypes to the Madonna, you know, just like you have different Madonnas. Uh, that are in different regions like the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Virgin of Lourdes. Different, you had different Madonnas in all these different areas as well. Same thing, Lady of the Heavens, right? And there's transmissions being beamed cosmically from the Kuiper Belt and other star systems with these beings, right, that are, are, are titled as gods as well at this time. And uh, when you look into Asherah and... Uh, all of these and uh, Inanna and uh, Ishtar, right? They would have husbands, fathers, sons, all the all in one package. So, uh, Astarte or Asherah or Ina Inanna or Ishtar, they would have a father, husband mate son as well uh one of them being called that you might recognize the name ball or bale right one of them well ball literally means lord or master right so when the goddess would would say a uh uh um and an, uh like a warming quotation about her god husband right uh an endearing message towards him when she would call him and quote him 
she would call him certain quotations and certain phrases. One of them being, and she, they would be calling Baal this, and, and El, these, these gods on the pantheon. So when their goddess would call to their god, they would call him certain things in Ugaritic writings or whatever writing, Sumerian, you know, cuneiform, that would translate in English to basically, uh, you know, the wife would call, the goddess would call her husband uh, things that would translate in our language to uh, master of the universe or he man. So Baal means master. She would call him that literally means master of the universe. She would call him her, his her uber man or her he man, right? And this is exactly what is in the cartoon, right? He it's called he man, master of the universe. That's the exact same terminology of what um, Inanna would call her husband, right? And uh, not only that, but let's talk about. What He Man is about. First of all, the character and Shira, it's the same same thing as well, right? But He Man, the main character, his name first of all is Adam, like the first man. He's blonde haired, Aryan blonde haired Nephilim bloodline, right? And he's at first a regular man, but then he finds this this giant sword, and he picks the sword up and he chants a special spell, and he says, "By the power of Grayskull." And when he says this, transforms his DNA and his genetics to a Nephilim Uberman type awakening, right? And not only that, his when he raises the sword, he's also connected to this giant Nephilim skull castle that's converted into a megalithic temple. It's literally – the castle is literally made out of a giant skull. That was once the head of a giant Nephilim being with fangs, and they converted it into a sacred megalithic temple. And when he raises his gray sword in the air and says, by the power of Grayskull, you know, Grayskull is, is the name of this megalithic Nephilim skull. When he says that, he transforms into an uber He-Man, right? But he's a good guy, right? He's, and he's got this blonde hair. Right, and he's even able to communicate and transform his his animal friend, his panther friend, right. And not only that, but his the goal and whole idea of He Man, master of the universe, is that he's got to protect this huge megalithic Nephilim skull temple, the Gray Skull. He's got to protect it from the evil ones from taking it over. It's a sacred spot. A uh, sacred temple, and he's got to protect it from being hijacked by Skeletor and his and his evil friends. And basically, Skeletor and his men are the disembodied Rephaim spirits trying to take over the sacred temple and summon evil from that location. And this is exactly what we have on our planet, right? And even in the psyche. It's it's been generated in us, right? Even like with the Highlander and all these shows, these are all Nephilim terminology and Nephilim things going on, right? And it's straight out of that, right? And uh, it's really intense when you start to break it down and you see the truth behind it all. And there are sacred spots like this all over our planet that that. Even is talked about in He Man, like sacred locations that, you know, you know, for those that don't know, the Catholic Church literally made this a mission to go and build some of their sacred technology temples on these locations. I've talked about some of them before, um, but it's really intense. I mean, not even getting in to the deep technology of some of the churches and. Uh, like in the Notre Dame cathedrals that were built, the actual churches themselves, but what they were built on top of is truly intense for those that don't know. And many don't, even people that live right in France, right? right? They have the, the Nautz pillar that was literally discovered right under the choir of the Notre Dame de Paris, right? And this was a Parisian... Uh, knots, a uh, gift from the Parisian knots, which is which was this guild of, of these seamen, these sailors, 
and it was given to Emperor Tiberius, uh, Tiberius a long time ago. You know, this is like first century, right at the turn of the first century, right around those times. And this is a, a, a pillar, a megalithic pillar, uh, you know, an old stone pillar that's dedicated to the, the Jupiter, God of Jupiter. And uh, there's statues and all sorts of um, dedications and, and old stone pillars to uh, Cernunos, the god Cern or Kern down there. St these are stag gods. You know, staghorn gods. Also, pillars and stone circles that are dedicated to, like, the mother goddess and things like this. And these churches are built and dedicated to the same things, you know. And, uh, yeah, there's been ruins of all sorts of temples that these churches are built on top of. The Cathedral of of uh, Notre Dame T. Paris that I, I'm talking about right now. I mean, serious. This is literally on top of an ancient foundation of uh, other temples too, like to the goddess Diana that they, of course, built uh, uh, on top of it and, and, and now made it to the, the Virgin. You know, <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, uh, even the Saint uh, Sulpice Church Solpice Church uh, built on the Temple of Isis as well. Um, you know, France is is all over France. This is this happens. I mean, all over. There's even cathedrals in in various places that are built over places that had Roman orgy baths. So, you know, really intense. When you really start to get into it, some of these – where these cathedrals are, are, are built on top of. So it would blow people's minds when they start to look into it. And uh, yeah, I mean <laughs> serious. And there's actually – there's actually um, an interesting – there's there's an interesting um, inscriptions. On, on some things that, that actually point out to where these churches are. And, uh, you know, when you guys start to do research on, on some of the places that people, that these churches are built upon, people would really be surprised. They would really be, really be, their minds would be blown on, on where they pray and think that there's holy, that, that it's the most holy ground in the world. You know, and things like this, it, you know, people are, are pretty, you know, there's there's a, actually a speaking stone that's outside a cathedral. Um, I think it's the Le Mans in Le Mans. This is uh, in France. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the St. Julian Cathedral. I think it might be the St. Julian Cathedral, but there's speaking stones that are out. There's a speaking stone that's somewhere outside the cathedral that have carvings on it. That talk about various churches that are built literally on top of these Roman orgy baths. Um, one of them being right in France, one of the Notre Dame cathedrals, the Reims Cathedral, right? And uh, and the the Saint um, Etienne Church, another one in uh, I, I forget the the place that it's actually the town it's called, but these are parts where they have these like crypts of water beneath them where the water was a place where they were there where it was a spot where roman orgies took place right these bath roman bathhouses that were like ritual orgies you know um it, crazy you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting i mean there's an interesting um menher that's outside one of those cathedrals in Le Mans. I think it's the same cathedral, the St. Julian Cathedral, actually. Uh, one of the towers. I don't know if it's in the south or the north, but there's one of the towers in the Le Mans Cathedral has this amazing menher, which is also like a, a stone pillar for people who don't know. Uh, menher. Menher is sort of like the ones you see in Karnak. Um, there's one of green granite that's outside. That's still, as far as I know, it, you know, from pictures I saw from years back, you know, maybe like 10 years ago, um, as far as I know from pictures I saw 10 years ago of the place that it was still visible. It's on the side of the wall near one of the towers. You know, it's of green granite, which is really amazing. You know, and I've I've gotten heavily into the 
the granite, specifically granite mega structures and pillars and, and uh, obelisks. These are have been very special and stuff that I've been researching for a, a while now. You know, there's there's very interesting object. I mean, even even dolerite that is even harder than granite. That you, there's some interesting things of dolerite. I mean, even um, in the Palermo uh, Palermo Museum, they have an interesting stone that talks about things from the the very very earliest dynasties uh, um, Egypt on the the dolerite. They have these uh, these fragments. In, in the Palermo Museum of it, you know, and there's even some dolerite that was found in the Aswan quarries of ancient Egypt. For those that don't know, there's two Aswan quarries in in ancient Egypt. Uh, I forget the name of them. One of them's uh, one I forget one of them's Elephantine, but I forget the other one. Uh, uh, I think it starts with an S or something, a shalal or shell. I'm not sure. I forget the second name, but there's two. They're actually like I, there's an island and there's islands in the in uh in the Aswan. You know, this is right on the Nile. This is in the Nile. There's the Aswan quarries, and this is where a lot of red granite comes from in e- Egypt. But I I actually think some of these obelisks were and and things of red granite were actually made in right on the spot and. There was various technologies they used to actually take the metals out of it all as well and to liquidize it and then reharden it, that it was actually living flesh at one time. And I've remote, remote viewed this. Actually, this is how I found my friend Roger Spur. I'd be arguing with Roger sometimes but because he thinks he's, he's 100% right about everything all the time. I'm trying to tell him you can't just go on Google Earth and take a snapshot and be like, look at this cave. I I know 100% that this is a freaking vagina or whatever he says. And I'm like, how do you, you, you can't, how do you know? I mean, you're not there. Maybe if you go there, you'll look like it was something other kind of material that was melted on the side of the cave or something. Maybe it's really not what you think some giant mess, muscular thing, you know, like uh, the inner walls of some giant beast freaking vaginal you know, it's not you can't just go on Google Earth and think that 100 percent you're right, you know, but I do think he's on, uh, you know, he's on the right track with some things. But I, I argue with him about a lot of it. He gets mad at me because of it. But this is why you need really some scientific hard proof. You need to be there and investigate it. Like when I went to North Salem Balanced Rock various times, even in the winter to see what it looks like when it gets really wet. You know, to see if it starts almost oozing something when it's very wet and see after it rains in the summer. You know, I've been there in the summer after it rains as well to see what it looks like. And I truly feel that that stone was once flesh, but um, I feel it was molded to look like the feline head that it looks like. And it possibly could have been a heart at one time or something like that. But we're going to be right back at this. Censorship and regulation is becoming an ever growing. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones, obviously, under heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs>
are back. Welcome, everybody, to the Truth Frequency Radio Network. It is Saturday night. We are live deep inside the airwaves of the Truth Frequency Radio Matrix. Whether you're hearing us on iHeartRadio or TalkStream Live or Paranormal Alternative Radio apps or right here on TFR, welcome. You have stepped inside the Eye of Ra, broadcasting these transmissions from the phantom shores of the ghostly Hudson River of New York. We are live here, live with the Tibetan Bell, chilling on the phantom shores, and people all over the airwaves are cheering. For the Truth Frequency Radio Network, we are here, and we are having a good time here. Yeah, we are dropping info. What a great first half. And we're just going to bring even more heat tonight because we are – I mean, I am really excited to be here. It's an amazing time that we're having. I know the times are hectic, but we got to use these these radio shows – to broadcast not only information but vibes that not only bring awareness to certain things but bring hope and bring the free will frequency back. And it's all about information. It's all about genetics and information being transported and transmitted different ways. And this is what we have to talk about and realize. And uh, – it's all about what I'm talking about. And, you know, even when you look into it, I mean, Nikola Tesla is talking exactly what we're talking about, you know, what he believed. I mean, completely his concept. He was saying this in many different ways that. And for those that don't know, in the first segment, I'm talking about the ore cloud and how that's the first sphere of our universe. Right. Well, The first very uh, forms of life that come into the ore cloud, the bacteria that's inside the comets and frozen bacterias, right? These old ancestral bacteria. These are the first forms of life that come out of the quantum environment. These little machines that are carrying coded information in them, right? These bacteria, these little forms of life are the first forms of life that come out of the quantum world and they're carrying the messages of life that come from the spiritual world that come from the the quantum environment and all the ancient mystery schools taught that the bacteria comes first from the spiritual world that viruses come first from the spiritual world they first from come from thoughts they first come from the quantum environment And then when they come into the first into the or cloud into our solar system, they're they're first coming in the forms of bacteria carrying coded messages. And I think this is ultimately what Tesla meant. I mean, Tesla's concept of the ether was very interesting. I mean, he talked about and how do I know this? You know, I never met the guy, of course, but there was an unpublished article of Tesla, actually, that um, this guy, Irvin. Uh, Laszlo had cited um, in his one of his articles that I've read and where he talks about the Akashic field, uh, Tesla. And in the article, Tesla is talking uh, what he calls like uh, natural media, this field that's very similar to what the, the Vedics would call the Akashic record. All right. He talks about this cosmic field that's basically imprinted with information and it has – the, the remembrance, the stored remembrance of all events that's ever happened on Earth. And what do I think is meant by this? The events that's happened on Earth, what does this mean? The past cosmic viruses and evolutional changes on our planet. That's our evolutional past. That's our stored events. The past events of virus and bacteria, the, the cemetery of viruses of our ancestral past that led to our cosmic change that led to the seeding of life and the continual evolvement of life do you realize that life basically started right when it possibly could on our planet right 
four point I think it two billion years ago, life started on our planet, and it started right after there was all these many, 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 many continuous years of comet bombardments and meteor showers. Right, so there's this continuous bombardment of seeding of life of bacteria by these comets, and then as soon as that ends, life emerges. It was seeded this way, right, through information, right, and these these stored events are all stored within our akashic record, and it's a stored event of genetics, of DNA, of bacteria, you know, and for Tesla. There's literally a cosmic energy or what we – or what some would call a prana, right, or uh, you know, an orgone, you know, things like this, scalar, that acts uh, – that an imprint that's, that sort of acts on this, this field and transforms it into matter. You know, it acts on this energy field and makes it become into this world as bacteria and eventually into forms of life and matter. Right. And matter, uh, you know, this, you know, comes into form of bacteria and then it, bacteria goes into other life forms and things like this. And it changes. It changes like this is I think this is what we're talking about here. You know, matter then dissolves back in the Akashic field. You know, this is very interesting. You know, and it's it's Tesla talked about it and many other people talked about it in their own way, even Rudolf Steiner and Casey and and many other people and uh i do think it's directly related and we have a free will frequency in our on our planet at least and throughout the universe i think with all sentient creatures without the universe i think it exists all life forms and for us we can see that i feel now people can say can our free will we free will frequency and can this be violated can our free will be free and i think it is a, a frequency because it's an actual harmonic cosmic law the actual action and feeling and emotion and thought of having free will it, it that is a cosmic universal harmonic law that's embedded in the very fabric of creation of who we are in all sentient creatures you know, the liberation of having a freedom of thought. And I think for those that also have, have incarnated or chose to incarnate on worlds where we have physical bodies, such as the world that and the dimension that we're in, you know, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's involved in this and as well. And, it, and that the free will can be friggin' like damaged. Or, uh, you know, and there's a variety of choices that we can make and others around us to make that there's also a physical feeling, right? A bodily, uh, to our, and, and we have physical senses and all these feelings that have a liberation to do what we feel, right? And when, like, when, when we do this, when we have this this feeling, like right when we're when we have a liberation to do what we really truly believe in and want, this builds up a fear. Uh, 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 I mean, a, a field, a, a sphere, a field of energy, right? A web of power of not only thought, of energy, of feeling, of vibe, a web of 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 liberation, right? When we truly have this desire to be something. Or to move beyond things and people are trying to put restrictions on us or you can't do that or you'll never be that or you'll never this 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 this, this builds a certain vibe in us and then we st if we start to carry out that and succeed in it it starts to generate this frequency you know of our free will right and that very frequency has been tampered with and I feel being violated and that's part of our cosmic fabric creation and that's why there's something happening to our cosmic evolution that's one of the re real reasons i feel we are being tampered with by these bloodlines right and it's very interesting here what i'm talking about you know and there's something 
that we just, you know, it's unseen to many, you know, when, you know, people are telling that somebody that they're not good enough, right, that, you know, all of this, that they'll never do this and that, and they have their own, you know, creation and free will to do and create what they feel. And many try to stop it. Many and many of artists felt a life where others were trying to restrict them or where they were made got made fun of or they they you know they had problems, right? And they were never you know always put down and people would said they would never be able to do what they really want. And then they that's so you know, they were always trying to, you know, restrict them in all these different ways and these feelings create the very music that the person will generate or art that they generate and that that frequency inside right that that music that's generated from those feelings you know it'll 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 it'll, others will feel that and it generates a web of power that's why it happens. You can hear it in the music of certain artists. Their struggle, right? Their, their, all this, and and it gets generated. And other, pe- that's how people cling to that, and it gives them goosebumps when they hear it. And sometimes it even creates movements, right? Certain musicians, certain, certain bands, and what they're playing and what they're doing, it can create a whole movement and change a, a way of life for a whole group of people. For, for a decade, right? And it liberates people. It's a, it's, a, it's a frequency. Because, you know, and this is certain, and this is also to show you how our free will has been restricted because certain things like that exist where we're, where we're currently living in a, 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 rea- a, a realm, a reality where the, where the, the literal harmonic resonant frequencies that's actually keeping the fabric and nature of existence and this reality together has been violated and infiltrated and given a cosmic virus, which is basically the Garden of Eden story, right? Data uh, is received and in, ingested and digested and then crashed that current reality and belief system, knowledge that that person in the Garden of Eve, Adam and Eve, that couple received, right? They 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 bit into it. It could have been bacteria in there that contained data that they received and activated. That once they had that data and the information, it crashed that system that they could never be the same again. Now it was a new reality that now existed. Uh, that that system was crashed. And what now exists was a new world and a new world order, right? It changes what people do and think because of the information that was ingested and digested. And the harmonic frequencies, the thought emotions, the brain waves that are pumping out of us has changed. You know, and this can be done by literally injecting, inserting data, information people really didn't intend to have, but digested, <laughs> literally. And this is happening right before our eyes right now, right? Right. But the information is literally masked or veiled with the illusion of free will, right? Right. Like, let me give you an example. Like, it seems like you have the free will. To turn the TV on and to choose what you want to watch, right? What particular TV station or radio station you want to listen to. But did you choose or or did – or first, let's say this. You didn't choose, first of all, to receive any unseen harmful frequencies or, or microwaves or waves that are – coming out of it and being you're being bombarded with those are unseen of course right or the tons of subliminal subliminal messages and data that's being impulsed into your mind right you didn't intend for those and even though you chose to watch this right and you didn't uh choose to watch or you know or the content you like supposedly chose to watch right 
right? This, so this, when, when you, you know, you supposedly chose to watch it because you turned it on, but did you really schedule what shows are on, right? Is this what you really truly wanted to watch? You could choose to, of course, shut it off and turn the whole TV off or channel off, right? But this is the case with most technology and things that's around us, right? It's sort of restricting our free will. It's masking us as with the, the mask and the veil of free will. But in reality, we're being impulsed with information we didn't intend to have, and it's keeping us in, in a lower state of existence, in a false reality, in an illusion, a maya. It's keeping us in a vibe. It's creating a, a society and timeline and existence. It creates a vibe, a frequency, a new world, right? And this is exactly what's going on right here, you know? I mean, right before our eyes. And there's certain things that's happening that is related to uh, life forms that you couldn't possibly imagine. And I tell you, when if you're looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, like I said, we shouldn't be looking for and sending sound waves. We should be looking about uh, where bacteria and viruses are coming from. If you want to look for the presence of extraterrestrial life on our planet, look for viruses that come out of freaking nowhere. That's – and follow that. Where that came from is where the extraterrestrial life is, is at, you know, and what's changing our evolution, you know. Um, you know, that's really interesting information. And I started to see that throughout history, certain ancient civilizations, right, really uh, high-level – you know, civilizations had some of the knowledge I'm talking about, but with high tech forms of genetic knowledge and free energy knowledge and harmonics and all of this that you couldn't possibly imagine. I mean, look at even in the Anunnaki writings, right? I mean, literally, uh, Anki is talked about. I mean, uh, in the pantheon of, of the Anunnaki and those and those Nephilim sort of um, Sumerian uh, assemblies of, of the Anunnakis, right? And uh, if you look into a lot of the um, books by um, Lawrence Gardner, you could find a lot of the um, you know the the bloodlines, the you know. The, the actual tree of the bloodlines that are related to this, um, like Anki and Enlil, that many have heard about. And these are basically genetic people that did genetic experiments and were, were doing cloning and all sorts of things. And I do believe um, it's related to viruses and, and comets and meteors and all of that stuff that I've been talking about. But Anki, um, which uh, can also mean like an archetype, right? Um, this There's a very interesting story that goes along with what Anki was about, what he did, and what's related to uh, possibly even the life of the human race. Or he at least created his own batch of humans. In the story, you can look at it several ways, uh, but there's writings talking about these instructions that, like, literally come from the the ancient dragon queen Tiamat, who was the the mother of the the the, the fallen ones, the Anunnaki, right? And she basically rises Anki. To tell him to fashion her these like servants. And Anki, uh, you know, he, he basically has to go like summon this Ninkursag, one of his relatives, another like godlike being or Anunnaki, right? And she was basically like uh, a geneticist, some sort of anatomical genius, right? And Anki basically gets her and she – they. there's this long story about her taking 
Anki semen and using a cross fertilization, you know, this doing this cross fertilization of different life forms, and that there's this sort of thing that's called this this house of Shimti, which is a literal creation chamber. Uh, Shimti basically uh, broken down into Shimt, meaning breath, wind, life. You know, it's a creation chamber. And they talk about how, you know, uh, Anki, uh, uh, there's like these 14 new humans that, that, that are made after the flood, seven boys and girls. And there's, there's all, you know, there's these fragments of tablets that have all these writings about this, you know, and it's literal genetic experiments and cloning going on in all of this. And not only were Sumerians talking about this, but the ancient Egyptians were talking about this. And I talked about it several weeks ago that uh, ancient Egyptians from the earliest dynasties, pre-dynastic most likely, way, way before, the people who invented Egypt and laid out the very structure and map of the, the layout in lower Egypt – I do believe laid out that whole sort of area as a place of the gods, as a place of knowledge of of uh, a high level technology that's related to transforming and uh, genetic, you know, genetic information, all this, and and it's related to bacteria and transforming DNA and all that. And even the whole Giza area is laid out as the underworld or gut of Egypt, just like the gut of our of, – or the underworld of our body. When you look at our body, um, we have the, the, the heavens, our, our consciousness and our brain and, and our brain ab- above, and we have our brain below, the gut, the underworld, you know, uh, and – Anubis is the lord of the underworld, the lord of the gut, the lord of the stomach, and the lord of that area of Giza, of Rosatau. That's what it's really called, you know. And he basically prepares the pharaoh at the moment of death to transform, and he prepares it by adding bacteria to the gut, to the stomach. He's the lord of the gut, the lord of the stomach. And I found – Complete evidence of this, of them talking about it and actually talking about microbial viruses in their symbology. You know, it's very interesting stuff. And uh, the Vatican is very much aware of of things like this. And I think where it's being set, set up and they're setting up their facilities in these areas where they know Nephilim stargates and portals have been opened up and summoned. Where Nephilim kings have been summoned and things like this have happened and where other bacterias and information has been sent from other star systems. And one of these places is Mount Graham. You know, in Mount Graham, they have uh, I don't know how many observatories and facilities up there in that area. And Mount Graham is one of the sacred ro- ro- locations on our planet, and that those facilities are literally some of the. And you know, the Vatican Observatory is is straight out of the work of of Jesuit George Coyne, um, once director of the Vatican Observatory in the 1970s, and uh, he led to having Mount Graham in Arizona. The Vatican having those facilities up there, and of course, one of the telescopes up there was first called Lucifer, right? These uh, large binocular telescopes, and Mount Graham is one of the most sacred areas in the world to many Native American and First Nation tribes. It it literally is one of the most sacred. One of the one of the most sacred spots in, in in the world to them, you know, and uh, you know we'll talk about this coming back from break. We'll pick it up right there because I, I think I wanted to get into that a little bit tonight as well, 
because uh, this is a very interesting place and we have uh, a lot going on in that location of Mount Graham. And uh, we'll get into that right when we come back. Don't go anywhere, anybody. Of course, you're inside the Eye of Ra on the Truth Frequency Radio Network. It's Saturday night. We'll be right back after this. As we slide into the You're listening to the Truth Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. Thank you for joining us. We are inside the Eye of Ra every Saturday night from 7 to 9 Eastern, of course, or 4 to 6 Pacific or wherever you are embedded in this matrix. Check us out at tfrlive.com slash Eye of Ra or tfrlive.com slash chat if you want to join the chat. And, of course, we're talking about, in the last segment, right before the break, Mount Graham. I mean, this is a very sacred place. Um, You know, uh, Mount Graham is one of, to the Apache at least, is one of the four holiest mountains in all of the world to American Indians. And this is what they would call, in our terms, a stargate. Right, and this is why they have some of the most expensive and high-tech binocular telescopes pointed towards that Stargate. You should see the complex of uh, <laughs> um, you know, telescopes and observatories and stuff that they got. Not only does the Vatican have facilities on Mount Graham. Their, their largest telescopes, like I said, like Lucifer and other ones. I think they might have changed it from Lucifer, but uh, that. But NASA has facilities up there and uh, other universities and facilities up there. I'm going to put in uh, a quick little picture in the chat room to just show an example of all the facilities that they have in Mount Graham. And like I said, this is one of the four holiest mountains in the world to the Indians. It's a, it's a place of a wormhole, a stargate. But they looked at it that it was like a sky a sky ground, a holy ground for what we might label Nephilim, Nephilim or Rephaim spirit kings. You know, for those that don't know, um, it says in uh, most biblical and 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 those kind of related scriptures. Why the Rephaim even are sometimes called giants and also dead things or spirits because they are not permitted to go to heaven and they are not permitted to rest by God. And they are also have their skin stripped of their souls and their souls to be always at, you know, as wandering, a wandering, yearning, disembodied spirit. And the Nephilim and Rephaim and those sort of tribes with their being part fallen angelic intelligence and cosmic intelligence and their stellar knowledge, they made sure through sorcery 
and their technologies, spiritual and physically, that when they died and they became disembodied spirits, that they would have certain abilities and they would transform and be able to be summoned in certain locations that they fortified before they died. Certain stargates on this planet that they constructed, megalithic places and certain areas and high certain places where there's natural stargates within the cosmos. They made a connection, a funnel of energy, a torus field, a stone circuit, torus sphere, and different uh, megalithic temples and sacred sites. They made those connection spots to the natural stargates within the cosmos. And one of these spots was known to the Native Americans, and not a lot of these places uh, and, and tribes like the Apache had mixed with Nephilim intelligences. All tribes have stories of red giants, red-haired giants, and different tribes that they both clashed and, you know, intermingled with and were taken and, and things were happening. You know, I, I've talked about in the past, they had a problem with procreation, these tribes of giants, and they resulted in using their spiritual sorcery technology and genetic technology to summon their Nephilim fallen angelic parents and summon that data at certain locations to help them give birth to moon children, avatars, right? Help from the stars. And, it, and also, a lot of times when you see these virgin queen of heavens, these virgin births of avatars without sex, that's because some sort of bacteria carrying DNA or some sort of DNA was given to transform and bring a new seed of life. And this is what they're talking about when a virgin mother brings new, a new b being to the world. A new form of life, a new form of transformation and, and a new being, a new race so almost, a new state of the virgin giving birth without sex. It's a new form of cosmic intelligence on the planet that's brought here from another star system. And this is what the origins of the virgin is. It's very interesting, you know, when you talk about Mount Graham. Mount Graham was like a holy ground spiritual graveyard. You know, it was like a, a definitely like a some, some some sort of holy ground. And they said that, you know, they're not only were the Apaches mad about them violating and coming on these grounds because of this, but they said there's even more problems related to the mountain spirits that protect these grounds. Right? They talk about the the beings that they call the the gone, which is G A A H N, these gone, right? These literal are these mountain disembodied spirits that protect the entrance and entrance and exit way to the doorway that's on top of Mount Graham that they call the Zil Nicha Si An. This is what they said in Apache. Uh, in Apache letters, in Apache words, Dizel Nachasian. This literally means the doorway that's on top of uh, Mount Graham to these beings, these disembodied mountain spirits that they call the Gon. And they were really upset that this would violate the Gon, who the Gon are. And, um, you know, the fact that the Vatican paid no mind to all of this and NASA and they still built their, their facilities on there. You know, that's very, uh, that's very interesting, you know, because they know they're waiting for something coming from that area. You know, uh, you know, they talk about these, these gone mountain spirits that, you know, people should not just look at this as, um, primitive belief systems of primitive people. This is high intelligence, and that area is a strategic geographic Stargate location. And, um, you know, the Apaches really had a problem with this, and they couldn't do anything about it. 
you know, and that that area, and I'm I'm posting here, um, in the chat room. Here we go in the chat room on TFR. This is one picture, but I think there's some other pictures I could probably get later on. But this is one picture in the chat room at, at tfrlive.com slash chat just to show you the amount of observatories that they have in that holy land of um, Mount Graham of the Apache. I mean, really, I mean, from NASA, all of them right within the same coordinates of each other. They know in that little radius that there's a reason to be over there, you know, um, and it's it's a fact. I mean. There's all sorts of places, and I've been shown, actually, I've actually remote viewed certain areas where I've been shown that they were setting up, um, they were working with giant, with copper in a huge way as well, some of these Rephaim tribes. And me working with copper, I was tapping into it um, on, on a deeper way, on a deeper level, you know, and that's why I get some of these things. This is how about the Kuiper Belt and the Ore Cloud, you know. When I would play my music and get lost in my songwriting, I would form these time tunnels, right? That I even talked about with Paris Tawson, you know, where time and, and everything else would just disappear. All thoughts and worries and time and all restrictions of this world would just disappear and free will would just burst. The free will frequency, the field, uh, you know, famous, you know, uh, the the well known author, the woman Chris Hardy would call it a semantic field, right? Uh, this is this is generated. Uh, I would call it a, with me a time tunnel, where I was starting to receive where where everything would disappear and I would lose all track of time and and thoughts and restrictions and 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 everything about this realm and it would just be about the creation of the music, and then interesting information would start to be coming in and i realized it was all had to do with the cosmic journey even the music that i was coming up with and, and things that were coming through right and during this is when i started to re clear my mind enough and silence everything else where i would able to be able to connect to other sentient creatures that are related to my own cosmic journey and i started to be shown where certain things were at in our universe through my inner sight even though i wear contacts and or glasses and my physical sight happens to be a little poor right in this realm when i'm connecting like this spiritually and maybe my brain waves are even getting to like an eight hertz state if they measure them i'm actually able to see for miles like i'm able to see through the cosmos, even able to see down to the very cells of my body and i see little torus fields spinning around each individual cell and it makes a net around me like a bell and then i'm able to see into the star systems what i into the kuiper belt and into the ore cloud for little little flashes into these places and i'll get little no uh, a knowing that comes over me about it and i started to record this and write it down and then I started to build relationships with astronomers and astrobiologists to find out if some of what I've been seeing and experiencing is possible because I didn't even have to understand if I started to read and listen to some of their information, some of the terminology that they're naming things. I couldn't even understand. I would have to look up the words to see what they mean. I, it, it's taken me years now to try to make these connections and, and now I'm starting to realize a lot of what I've been recording is is not only possible but a reality and it's uh it's proof in the po it's proof right and we have a lot of this knowledge that's been rediscovered and lost and rediscovered over time and how it's applied has really changed our nature of reality and brought new world orders right and it's happening right now there's a new cosmic evolution and hybrid and 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 cyber fallen angelic acceleration of intelligence that's happening right now quantum level cosmic virus happening on multiple earths 
it's happening. Bacteria are being sent. Coded information is being sent to multiple Earth dimensions at, at simultaneously on a quantum level from galactic intelligences. And even a lot of the Marian apparitions that I've been researching that have been happening over thousands of years now are related to telepathic beams of information and experiences that are coming from our Kuiper belt. Literally. And people want to call me crazy for saying that. That's fine. In the future, they will realize that this is a fact. And a lot of what I've been talking about for the last several years, sometimes only a few weeks or months before it comes out in the news, uh, you, you've been seeing that I've been right about a lot of things. If not right, then pretty damn close. And we can get these impulses of information right during lightning storms even, you know, and things like this, right? It's all related. And the giants knew this. And they were setting up a lot of their seaports on certain areas that had access to copper mines and things like this. One of them uh, is in Ohio, for those that don't know. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's evidence and actual skeletons that's, that's actually been found there. Where, I, mean, I just got to look at my notes real quick, the exact name of the town. And I'll tell you in a moment, um, because I can't remember the exact name of the town that... They uh, they first that the that it's at, but I know it's near the Great Lakes, and I know it's like a seaport near the Great Lakes that uh, is uh, built with direct access, like sea, like you know, water access to the copper mines that are there. And it's a very interesting. It's in uh, Vermilion, uh, Vermilion, which is Erie County, Ohio. Uh, and it's a very interesting story that goes along with this. If anybody wants to really look it up, I know um, I have a friend, Glenn Kreisberg, who, I, who I, I've had on the show several times. Um, he's also connected me to Jim Vieira and uh, uh, Hugh Newman, who write about uh they have a book of uh, about giants several books about giants that they i think even mentioned it in their book but this is um an old nephilim stronghold right of rephaim sort of tribes you know stronghold one of the legends of the ancient tall one tribes that the native american told about you know the bearded ones and there's this ancient story that come out of the native americans that talk about these these black beaded giants right these black beaded giants that basically murdered and destroyed and cannibalized and killed off by these red bearded warriors and giants and they took it over and it was a, a, a basically a beach side town that had this direct water access to the very copper mines of the Great Lakes. And if you look it up in Ohio and Vermilion, you can look on the map, you know, that area where there's burial mounds in that area that bones have been discovered of these actual giant ones that have been taken by the Smithsonian, you know, um, you know, there's a there's been actual um, what is it? Paper clippings from 1858, November of 1858, that talks about um, the Firelands Pioneer Memoirs of Townships paper, right? In November of 1858, talks about this, and it's it's a it's a it's a factual historic statement about giant bones taken out of the mounds there. And uh, and uh, on the shore of this Vermilion in northern Ohio, you know, this is Lake Erie. And the quote in the article basically says there are quite a number of mounds in the township where the bones and sometimes the whole freaking skeleton of the human race have been found. Right. The bones and skeletons found are quite large. 
and some of the inhabitants think they must have belonged to a race of beings much larger in size than the Indians found here by the first settlers. It also goes on to say that it was a tradition of the Indians that the first, and this is in the 1850s that this was published in the paper. It goes on to say that the it, it was a tradition that the very first tribe occupying this whole country was a black bearded race, very large in size, and subsequently a red bearded race or tribe came and killed or drove off all the black beards as they called them. The Indians found here by the first white settlers belonged principally to the Sandusky, Tawa, and Chippewa tribes. And that is directly from the newspaper article that talks about this. And when you look it up and you research that area, you see that this is a beach port town, a seaport town with water routes access right into the copper mines of the Great Lakes. So this is really intense because when you think about um, the copper work and, and a lot of the stuff that actually was found, you know, giant bones – that are found with copper, you know, it started to really, when I started to reach the copper, you research the copper element of it all. That was very interesting to me as well, because there was a lot of different things that had to do with uh, giants and, and different places where they had uh, copper breastplates buried, giants buried with these copper breastplates and all this stuff going on, right? Very interesting, right? And these red-haired giants are all over. Some of them may need to be connected to the Denisovans in, in Siberia, you know, Neanderthals, all of this. Red hair could have possibly even come, like I said. I would say that the giants that came to America happened on multiple different times in history. Of course, people would think that the Europeans, like, you know um, – the you know the the um the Tawatha Danans, you know the giants you know that they would be the first ones to to make America and I don't think so I think they did come to America those kinds of ones but it happened later I think first the first ones to probably enter America I don't know about the first but um, the ones that are related to the biblical times and things like this I think it's more likely that the Phoenicians. And yes, the Phoenicians had giants. The Phoenicians had literal Rephaim kings were the leaders of the Phoenicians. You know, the, the very leaders of the Phoenicians were actually Rephaim kings. And they were the leaders of the cities that you see in history that are named like Carthage and Byblos and Sidon and Tyre, right? These were skilled seamen and sailors that came to – all over and came to the Americas and left their mark with their burial mounds and their megalithic sites and temples and walls and stone chambers and domes and carns and circles and stargates like I'm talking about, right? And these Phoenician Rephaim kings not only ended up becoming disembodied Nephilim king spirits that could be summoned at these spots and burial mounds, but they also made their mark in America in all sorts of different ways, Right. And this is what we would see. And I think later on, uh, we also saw like European giants that came on in and, and a different time. And it would, I think it would also be the Phoenicians that were the ones that ended up going to Mesoamerica and Central America first before any other giants. Or, you know, maybe Atlanteans and things like that were giants that we're talking about at a different time. But then beforehand, but I'm talking about in the more recent, like biblical times, and then later on, more closer to us, uh, it would be the European giants. But the Phoenicians probably would have been before the European giants. When you talk about the European giants, you're talking about like Tawatha Danan, even the old Irish giants called the Fomorians, right? And I talked about different tribes of giants um, within the Levant and that area. But when we talk about these tribes and some of the names like the Fomorians, I mean, we're talking about names where the very mention of the names, the very sound of the name, if somebody would mention the name, the very sound of the name would strike trembling fear into people, trembling fear into the very hearts of, of any 
living creature, like I discussed, right? Like men, leaving men soaked in their own urine, right? Where they can't even utter a word. This is like just really tribal stuff. And I would think that the Phoenicians were the first ones to uh, probably enter the United States and they left their marks. And a lot of these sites are linked and things can be summoned. These Nephilim kings can be summoned. At And there's sites, not only negative ones, but sites, installations of healing to transformation, to heal cells after battle. And I do believe one of these sites is North Salem, New York, where it's a healing chamber made by a Nephilim intelligence, you know, some sort of Nephilim Rephaim type tribe, you know, where it was a chamber where you can literally heal the cells of your body at certain times. Right. And certain installations were made at the equinoxes and solstice. You know, this is a uh, fertility gods and, and all of this are related. And, you know, there's so much going on um, at these sites. I mean, we can literally do a show every weekend and never run out of information about all this. And the Smithsonian um, doing all the cover up. We'll get into, you know, I mean, the Smithsonian. Started by James Smithson with a donation in today's money that would be probably close to 14 or 15 million dollars. You know, the Rosicrucians are linked to the ancient Nephilim rites and Anunnaki rites of Starfire. You know, the very Starfire fluid menstrual intelligence of the gods is the name of the Rosicrucians. That's where the Rosicrucian name comes from, for those that don't know. Uh, the fiery cross of the Rosicrucian is the red fluid intelligence, all seeing eye of the fiery cross of the 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 star fire, the elixir rubius, right? That is the Rosicrucian cross. You know, that is the name of the Rosicruce. That is from the dragon court of ancient Egypt. And we'll see you next week, everybody, as we spiral out. Try and hold the sun. I try and hold the sun.